You see, there are five types of E&M. The most common type in North America is E&M type 1, and we'll use a Roman numeral for that. Outside of North America, the most common type is type 5. These are the most common. There's an issue with type 1 and type 5, however. It could be an issue, and that is that they require a common ground. The router and the PBX in our example, they need to be plugged into the same electrical system. You might have heard the old saying that ground is ground the world around. Well, don't you believe it? I used to work in a campus where we had lots of conduit interconnecting buildings, and we had lots of copper running through that conduit. And I discovered something. If you interconnect the wrong two pieces of equipment with copper, and they're plugged into different electrical systems in different buildings, those different buildings might have different ground potentials, and smoke can come out of your equipment. We don't want that. That's an issue when we have geographically separate devices. E&M type 1 or 5, not a good choice. What do we do if we have geographically separated devices? The fix for that is E&M type 2. E&M type 2 allows us to have a ground on the router and a ground on the PBX. That's not common. There's another type, type 3, that you might find used in a large factory environment where we have large motors kicking on, large generators, large electrical spikes. Type 3 tries to make sure that electromagnetic interference is not going to be interpreted as signaling. And you might be wondering, okay, is there a type 4? We've talked about types 1, 2, 3, and 5. What about type 4? Well, technically, there is an e and type 4 in the industry but Cisco doesn't support it. So we don't think about e and Type 4 in the Cisco world. Now that we've talked about these different aspects of FXS, FXO, and e and ports, let's go to the router console and see how to configure it. We're out on the live interface right now. Before we start configuring a voice port, let me show you a command that will let us see what voice ports we have. The focus of this video, again, is on analog voice ports. We'll get into digital voice ports probably in the next video, but for now, just analog voice ports. Let's do a show voice space port summary, a nice summary overview that shows us the port identifiers, 1 slash 1, 1 slash 2, 1 slash 6. It tells us the type of port, FXS, e and M, FXO. It shows us the signaling type currently being used on these ports, loop start, wink start, loop start, if they're administratively up or down right now. Just a great overview of what ports we currently have installed. Let's begin by taking a look at the configuration for an FXS port. Let's go into global configuration mode and then go into voice port configuration mode. It's voice hyphen port. And let's go into the FXS port 1 slash 1. What sorts of things can we set up here? One thing we talked about was the signaling type, loop start versus ground start. Let's use some context sensitive help to see the options. We can say signal question mark and we see that we have two options, ground start, loop start. Loop start is subject to glare, ground start is not. Loop start detects that we've gone off hook because loop current starts flowing over the tip and ring leads. Ground start knows that we've gone off hook because there is a ground potential on the ring lead. Like in the movie War Games we talked about. Let's just set this at the default of Loop start. Something else we might want to do is play with the ring cadence. We could create a distinctive ring. For example, let's take a listen to how the ringing sounds right now on this phone connected to this port. Let's call into it. It rings for two seconds, then there is a four second silence period. And it rings for another two seconds. That's the default in North America, two seconds on, four seconds off. Oftentimes in TV shows and movies, if you notice, they vary from this. Maybe it's too much dead air. But in movies, oftentimes, it seems more like one second on, two seconds off. Check that out sometime. But for now, let's uh, create a distinctive ring. This would be great in a cubicle environment where people are gathered at the water cooler and somebody's phone rings. Well, if everybody rings the same way, it's hard to tell whose phone is that ringing. We can tell if we set up distinctive ringing. Here's the command. We say ring cadence, and there are several pre-built ring cadences for us. The default, again, is two seconds on, four seconds off. That's the North American default setting. I like to define my own. Check this out. We can say that we want to 
define a ring cadence, the units of measure are a bit tricky here. The units of measure are in one-tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds. Let's create a ring cadence of half a second. That would be five of those 100 millisecond units. Let's have a silence period. Then let's make it ring for five seconds. That would be 50 of these one-tenth of a second periods. And then let's have a silence period of one second. That's our ring cadence. Something I want you to notice, though, this does not take effect immediately. Some changes require that we shut down administratively and then bring the port back up. Let me prove it to you. Without shutting the port down, let's call back into that phone. And it's still two seconds on, and it's still four seconds off. How do we make it take effect? Well, we need to administratively shut down this port. Let's say shut down. And then we will bring it back up with a no shutdown. Now that we've done that, let's see if the ring cadence takes effect. Let's dial the number again. Wow, that was a really long ring. Yeah, I think we definitely have a distinctive ring, no question about that. Annoying, possibly, but definitely distinctive. And you could create different distinctive rings for different analog phones in your environment. Something else I want you to understand about an FXS port is that we can configure it as a special type of connection. Let's use some context-sensitive help. If we say connection question mark, we see that we could set up a PLAR connection. That's private line automatic ring down. We could create a tie line or a trunk. It's important that you understand these. PLAR is a lot like an emergency phone in an elevator or one of those phones alongside the roadway or a phone in a parking garage or maybe at an airport terminal. You pick up the phone and you don't have the opportunity to dial anyone. You're automatically connected to this predefined number. As soon as the handset goes off hook, a number is dialed. When I first heard about this, the analogy that came to my mind was Batman. The Batman, he can pick up the Bat phone in stately Wayne Manor or in the Bat Cave or in the Batmobile, and it immediately goes to Commissioner Gordon's office. That's Plar. Batman never dials Commissioner Gordon. He just goes off hook and he gets connected. Let me show you how to set this up. We can say connection Plar, or some people pronounce it Pilar. I've never heard an authoritative ruling on should it be pronounced Plar or Pilar. I like PLAR, so I'm going to stick with that. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to say connection PLAR, and I give a phone number that I want to dial. Let's say 2222. In other words, as soon as this voice port goes off hook, we're going to dial 2222. Let's go give it a try. I'm going to go off hook on the count of three. One, two, three. And as soon as we go off hook, it immediately dials this other number. I'm going to get rid of that configuration. I don't want to have a PLAR connection. I do want you to be familiar with the other types of connections, though. We could say connection tie line, connection tie line, and then we specify a number at the far end of this connection. A tie line is often used to tie together PBXs, and a tie line is brought up on an as-needed basis. Contrast a tie line with a trunk. A trunk is an always-on connection, again, that might interconnect a couple of PBXs. And there's an option to specify the digits, the phone number at the far end. But beyond that, there's another option I want you to be familiar with, and that's the answer mode option. Answer mode says we're only going to bring up this permanent trunk connection when we receive a call from the far side. We're not going to initiate the trunk connection, in other words. We're going to be in an answer mode. And there's also a timer, the retry timer, where we could retry a failed connection every so often. Please be familiar with these different connection options. They used to be covered in an older version of C-Voice. They're no longer covered as far as the configuration goes in the current version of C-Voice. But you might need to know some of this for the exam. So I want to make sure and cover this material. Well, that's our FXS port. Let's jump into our FXO port for a moment. Remember, an FXO port might connect to an office, a central office. Let's go into voice port 1 slash 6. That's our FXO port. We could specify a signaling type, loop start or ground start. Something else we might want to specify in voice port configuration mode. This is not the only place we can specify it, by the way, but here's one place. We could specify what codec. 
we could say what coder decoder do we want to use for this voice port. We say codec, coder decoder, and we follow that with the type of codec that we want to use. Typically we might use something like G729R8, which takes up 8 kilobits of bandwidth per second. That's payload only, not including overhead. That might be a good codec for us. Something else I want you to understand that's not really addressed thoroughly in the current C-Voice course is trunk groups. Let's say that we create something called a dial peer. A dial peer is a way that we add call routing intelligence to the router. We'll talk about that in a future video later this month. But when we get there, a dial peer is going to say, for example, to get to this phone number, send your voice call out of this port, maybe out of this FXO port. Well, maybe we've got several FXO ports that could get us out to the central office. Which one do we use for this dial peer? The dial peer, instead of pointing to just one voice port, it could point to a trunk group, a grouping of ports. If I want to make a port a member of a trunk group, I could say trunk hyphen group, and I could specify the name of the group. Let's just imagine that we have a group called test group, and I can add the preference of this particular voice port. If it's most preferred in the trunk group, it's going to have a preference of one. Higher numbers are less preferable something we can set up in voice port configuration mode, which kind of begs the question, how do we set up the trunk group to start with? Well, let's back out to global config for a second. We could say trunk group, and we give the name of test group, and that takes us into trunk group configuration mode. And there are several things we could set up for a trunk group. As a reference for something we're going to be talking about later this month in another video, I want you to understand that when we're doing digit manipulation using a voice translation profile, please understand that a translation profile can be applied to a trunk group. We might have one created named test profile, for example. Again, that's coming up in a future video, the concept of voice translation rules and voice translation profiles. When we get there, just know that we can apply this not only to a dial peer or a voice port, we can apply it to a trunk group. Well, there's one other type of voice port we talked about. It was an E&M analog voice port. Let's say voice hyphen port 1 slash 2. And the signal type is going to be different because this is E&M. We had the immediate, the delay, and the wink start signaling. Typically, we're going to be using wink start signaling. Something else we could specify for an E&M port was its operation. Is the operation two wire or four wire? Remember what we're saying here. We're saying how many wires are used for tip and ring. And maybe we say it's two wire. Yet another parameter that we needed to have match up between the router and the PBX was the E&M type. We could say type. And although there are five types, Cisco does not support type four most common in North America is type 1. Oh, actually, I have to use the decimal number. I was stuck on Roman numerals there for a second. But type 1, that's most common in North America. Keep in mind, though, that that requires we have a common ground. These devices, the router and the PBX, they need to be in the same geographic location on the same electrical system. Type 2 allows those devices to be geographically separate, however. Well, that's going to wrap up our configuration of analog voice ports. Next time, we're going to be talking about digital voice ports. And once we get our voice ports configured, then we're going to take a look at dial peers. A dial peer is going to say, to get to this phone number, maybe go out of this voice port or this trunk group, or send voice over IP call setup packets to this remote IP address. And later on in the month, we'll talk about digit manipulation. But the focus again for today was on analog voice ports. Hope you enjoyed it.